Hey guys, welcome to a Vaguely Familiar Podcast. Today, my guest was Rob Harvilla. Rob Harvilla is a podcaster, editor of The Ringer Magazine and The Ringer Podcast Network. He has a very, very efficient podcast uh, called 60 Songs That Explain the 90s. Um, this podcast has been going on since you know 2020, and it's, I think, one of the top podcasts on Spotify. Um, we got to talking about anything every everything between the 90s music to music today to artists like John Mayer to fans like the Swifties to going really in depth about the Goo Goo Dolls for some reason um I mean hey I'm not complaining I, I love the Goo Goo Dolls every single day uh, I'll, I'll take them any day of the week and uh, it was just a wonderful podcast a wonderful human being one of my favorite people to listen to in the car um I just can't believe that he was uh, gracious enough to come on our show and uh, he gave his, he gave us the time of the day and really appreciate that. So I hope you guys really enjoy this podcast. If you like what you listen to and if you like what you hear, uh, leave a review, like, comment, share with your friends, you know, um, leave a review on Spotify, Apple Music, uh, stuff like that really helps us, you know, you know, kick the algorithm out of the way and get this, get the word out for our podcast. So thank you very much for listening on to the show. um rob thank you very much for being on man i honestly <laughs> you're laughing but when i say that you're like a dream guest like you're a dream guest honestly <laughs> i've spent that wow <laughs> again you're That's laughing very sweet but like <laughs> the list the list was um for dream guests the list was like john mayer right <laughs> and then it, and then it goes uh ali abdal who's a very famous then, like youtuber yeah. right and okay. then Rob Harvilla. Those and are the then three me. we wanted this to get on. This is the first time I've ever been associated with John Mayer in any sense. And it is a great honor to me, of course. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, man. No, for sure. Uh, you were <laughs> like, uh, I've spent so much time with you in my car. This is kind of weird to see you like <laughs> face to face. I'm like, this is not how I imagine <laughs> Rob to look yeah. like. It's really when people say like, we, you know, we listen to you on a road trip, like even imagining a car somebody driving while listening to me let alone with like more than one person in the car it's such a strange notion to me i mean this is my first podcast right this is my first time doing this and like that sort of parasocial aspect of people listening to my voice and like having my voice in their ear it's just such a different sensation to me than you know writing a taylor swift record review or something like that it's just an entirely new concept <laughs> I wonder why, because, okay, you are a podcast creator, but I'm, I also assume you consume podcasts as well. So, like, you have that weird parasocial relationship with those people, don't you? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like, yeah. I want to yeah, think, absolutely. like, so how is that weird for you then? Well, I, did, I never imagined myself doing it, right? You know, like, The Ringer obviously has tons of podcasts, and I love them, you know, and I listen to them all the time. Like, I'm out here in Ohio. I never go into the office you know, I only know most of my coworkers like through Slack. Right. And so the main way that I communicate with them is just listening to them on their own shows. Right. It's not me talking. It's just me listening. But I just for years I did that and I never really imagined that I would be doing it myself. You know, I right up into the moment when this happened, when I started doing this show, I never thought I would do a podcast. I had never imagined it for myself. And so to be that person you know, to have people, you know, whatever it is, 75, 77 episodes now of this show that people have listened to. It's like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of words. It's like however many hours of my voice. It's just such a bizarre thing to imagine people doing in their leisure time. Right. Or like while they're washing dishes or while they're driving or whatever. It's just I, I, I'd gotten used to the idea of other people who were good at it doing this but i had never thought that i would do it myself <laughs> hey you're damn good at it man like i'm i'm not i'm not here kissing your ass you're really good <laughs> well, thank you no i appreciate it man thanks so much can i ask you what is the signed goo goo dolls thing over your right shoulder what is yeah, that there this is so okay this is a, this is a really good story i'm glad you asked uh this was not like uh okay put there so you could question about it but uh, here we are now. Um, so, <laughs> thank you for clarifying. Yes. So, um, I moved to. I'm originally from Pakistan, and I moved to Canada in 2012 with my family. We all moved here, and since okay. 2010, I've been a huge Goo Goo Dolls fan. Now, how a Pakistani kid from Karachi right. uh, discovers a band called the Goo Goo Dolls <laughs> is just beyond me, and we don't have to get into that. Uh -huh. The psychosis of that is just insane. But I got really into the Goo Goo Dolls. I like in, to get into that in my we'll late see. late yeah. teens. Like all I right. got into the alternate tunings and i was playing iris and i was like the only guy huh. in yeah probably a hundred 
mile radius that who knew who the Google Goo Dolls were. And then when we moved here, uh, they went on tour in 2013 <laughs> with Matchbox 20. And uh, I was a big Matchbox 20 guy as well, yeah. which is which will all come back come back sure, into sure. you know your podcast and why I love it as a kid born in the late mm-hmm. 90s. But they were touring with Matchbox 20, and out yeah. of out of the blue, I just tweeted um, the drummer. Um, I was like, "Yo, your tickets are so expensive." And mind you, I, I'm like doing the currency exchange <laughs> from like Pakistan <laughs> to Canadian dollars. I'm like, it was like right. 85 dollars. It wasn't even that bad, yeah. right? And I'm like, yo, Ooh, I had to like a break a yeah, bone here to yeah. get get tickets. And luck, luckily enough, he replied, and he was like, okay, well, we'll hook you up. And then when I went to uh, the Wilson right. Amphitheater, uh, their manager came, took me backstage. I met the guys. I cried, first time ever. Like a 16 year old boy was crying in front of Johnny Resnick. <laughs> In front of Johnny and Robbie. Yeah, and then I actually uh, developed a relationship with Robbie after because I wrote them letters and they followed me on Instagram and Facebook. And, you know, I got married a few months ago and Robbie like wished me. I was just insane. Like these are the people I looked up to. Yeah. Damn. What is that object? Is that like a, is that like a speaker? It's a drum head. uh, Cable? It's a a drum, drum head. I'm sorry. And you know what the wildest thing is? But okay, that is rad. That man. summer, like that summer tour after the Matchbox 20, Google Dolls fired their drummer of 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh no. He seemed like a nice guy. I liked yeah. him. I liked, he yeah, was a really I don't nice guy. I think dude. you had anything to do. Yeah. And I was like, uh oh. He was on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. He was responsive. Yeah. Ugh. So, yeah, that's, that's where that comes well, from. Well, that's beautiful. That's amazing. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. And All honestly, right. like, when I when I met them, um, that was the first time. And then after that, there was another story where, like, in 2014, they toured again and they did Canada again. I had no money. Like, my dad, you know, was working security. I was a high school sure. student, and I and I just off the whim just DM Drabi. I was like, "Yo, you're coming like 20 minutes away. I cannot afford your tickets. Hook me." And up. he did. Yeah. <laughs> he hooked me up. It, and Front row did. tickets. Me and my brother are still one of the wildest it, nights ever. Front row yeah. tickets. Man, hey, when I tell you awesome. they're the nicest people That's in rock right. and roll, I, I honestly they are. I've had Midwestern <laughs> rock bands. Well, no, they're yeah. from Buffalo. Never mind. Honorary sure. Midwestern rock bands. Sure. Close enough. Buffalo's the Midwest of yeah. New York. They're closer somehow. to Toronto than they are to New York, which is crazy to me because I'm from Toronto. There yeah. we go. That's that's a good way. All right. That's yeah, but let's like, forget play. my origin story. I wanted to get into yours because I I did a <laughs> quick Google search yeah. and the first thing that popped up was a YouTube video of you eight years ago talking to the alumni of, uh, was it BSJ? Um, well, it was Ohio okay. University. And so it must have been, it must have been the journalism yeah. school. So, at so talk to me through that. Like, yeah, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know I was on, you're on YouTube. YouTube. That's I'm cooler than I thought. <laughs> apparently. Oh my God. I just want to, I want to get into like the deep untold than. story of Rob Harvilla. That's what I want. <laughs> All right. Take me from high okay, school. All Take right. me about well, the torments born. of your childhood. <laughs> what made you want to be the torments of my childhood? Ah, oh, it was great. <laughs> it was all great. Okay. Uh, I'm from Cleveland originally. I lived in St. Louis, Missouri a little bit as a kid, uh, but starting like fifth grade or whatever, when I was 10, 11, I moved back to the suburbs of Cleveland to a, a town called Medina. And I went to high school there. I went to college at Ohio University in Southeastern Ohio. They had a good journalism program. And that's where I went back and talked to students about something. Yeah. I don't know what I said. I'm sure it was insightful. <laughs> uh, but I, I I went to college for magazine journalism. I, I From 1996, I graduated in 2000. You know, and it's like, it was right before, it, the internet technically existed Right. You know, and like I had my first it was my first ever email address in 1996. But like it, it feels like a completely different. Can you share what now, your email right? address like was? I was trained. Was it something wonky? RH one seven five six nine six at oak dot cats dot Ohio U dot edu. It's a, I still know that wow. I don't I don't know why, but it's the longest, most convoluted email address imaginable. <laughs> that's crazy. And that's how you could get a hold of me in 1997. Uh, I started working in 2000. Uh, I worked, first of all, mostly for alt weeklies. Uh, I, my first job was one in Columbus, Ohio. We moved to Oakland, California for a little while. I was in New York City. I worked for the Village Voice for about five years. Uh, moved back here to Ohio. I'm in Columbus uh, now, right when my second son was born. I have two boys, 11 and nine, and now a young Young daughter, thank you. Turned two years old yesterday, actually. But just I've been just working out of my house here in Columbus. I worked for Spin Magazine remotely. I worked for Deadspin 
uh, the sports site remotely. I was with The Ringer when it launched in 2016, but this is all, like I said, writing, you know, like I came up as a rock critic, you know, interviews, features, you know, reviews of records primarily and a lot of obituaries. Like my standard joke is like, I'm one of the older people on staff at The Ringer and like, it's my job to talk about stuff that happened in the 80s. Cause I'm like the only person on staff who was alive <laughs> in the eighties. Right. So like, it's like when Bob Saget passes away, right. Like, and they need somebody, you know, Norm Macdonald, you know, any one of the Eagles, mm-hmm. like people like that. Uh, but, and so again, it's, it was all writing and, and obviously podcasts were a huge part of the ringer from the start. Bill Simmons is of course, but it, they became a bigger and bigger and bigger deal. And finally they came to me. I was like, you should probably start a spot a podcast, you know, like Spotify bought us, and Spotify was very interested primarily in podcasts as well. So I started doing this show in uh, October of 2020, right? You know, it's like we started talking about it in the summer. This is amid COVID. You know, my wife's pregnant with our with our daughter, and it's just sort of a chaotic time. And it, it, it felt good both to try something new and also to immerse myself like in nostalgia, quite frankly, like going back to the 90s, going back to when I was in high school and college, you know, it, it's sort of a throwback escapist nostalgia vibe was very appealing yeah. to me in that exact moment. Uh, and so I've been doing the show for two years and I'm sort of shocked at the response. You know, it's by far the the biggest response that I've gotten anything that I've done. Right. And I, I sort of, you know, I talk to other people of podcasts and they talk about that parasocial relationship. Yeah. Right. Like it's a, just an entirely different situation. Then, you know, you write something and somebody else reads it. I don't know if it's the voice or just the time that you spend with the person, but there's just there's some sort of enhanced. I don't want to say intimacy, but something there's there's a connection there that goes beyond, you know, just the written word, I guess. And so it's it's been wild. It's been great. It's been rad. You know, it's it's by far the most gratifying thing that I've ever done. And, you know, we, we started out, it was supposed to be 60 songs. We pushed it to 90, you know, cause there's too, many, too songs, many songs, you know, and I'm, I'm having a good time and I still feel enthusiastic about it. And, and the response is great. I just, okay. I want to take it back a little because I feel like you skipped over the part that I wanted to really dissect in. Right. I see, I see what you did there. I saw that. Okay. So I want, I want to talk about like a, <laughs> <laughs> like a 17, 18 year old Rob, right. He's, he just got into high, in, into university. Oh, he's just he's gotten into college. He's doing writing school. Mm-hmm. Did you want to be a rock critic at that age? Was that something that appealed to you? Absolutely. Who, and who were the people that you were looking up? It's to? the only thing I wanted to be. My sort of villain origin story is that I started reading Rolling Stone in the waiting room of my orthodontist <laughs> when I got braces in junior high. It's I. It's less who I wanted to look up to, but I just wanted to write for Rolling Stone. That's all I wanted to do you know, from 1994, you know, to the present in a sense, right? Like I, that's really what I, I went to school for magazine journalism to college for magazine journalism, which itself feels anachronistic yeah. now, right? Like that's not what they call yeah. it now. Um, but I wanted to write for Rolling Stone. I wanted to be a rock critic, you know, and I came out of college and started writing for alt weeklies, you know, which is itself sort of an archaic term or format you know there are still some but not nearly as many you know most of the papers that i wrote for are gone or very different versions of themselves but that was like a semi-logical path to maybe someday write for rolling stone right because in terms of the tone that you could have like the glib way to say it is like you could swear in yeah. all weekly as opposed to a daily newspaper, but you you could, you could have like stronger opinions. You know, there was more voice. You could be funnier. You could be more discursive. Like it was just freer in a lot of ways. And the downside of course, is they didn't have nearly, you know, the readership of a daily newspaper at that time. There was sort of an underdog aspect to it but you know that's the first three or four jobs i had were all at alt weeklies and i just moved around a little bit but that's sort of the voice that i came up with you know and you can take that too far like i cringe reading my old writing now as i think a lot of people do you know like because it's just so snarky and so teenage and it's not i don't think it's ever outright mean but it's just it's just it reads very obnoxious you know and like early 20s you know thinks he knows everything sort of vibe you know i just roll my eyes at myself (laughs) back then now but i mean it was sort of the way i got to hear right like there's a through line to the ringer you know which which encourages that sort of free you know voice heavy 
you know, personality style yeah. writing and encourages it in the podcasts yeah. as well. You know, it's, it's, it's weird feeling. I, I, I don't, I don't skip over that part on purpose, but I find it harder and harder to explain to younger people now. Right. Like it's just when, when, you know, when people who want to be rock critics or journalists are like, how'd you get your start? What do you recommend? It's like, you're coming, you're in a completely different universe. Yeah at 18, 19, 20, however old you are than I was at the time. Like my path isn't really logical from a 2022 perspective. Yeah. You know, it just, it feels very firmly like the past. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I didn't think we were going to get into your mortality so quickly into the podcast, but. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's my job. It is my job to be over dramatic about the criticism things. that rock critics get is that they're overly critical of music. Um, hmm. how do you, what do you respond to that? Like, do you feel like that's true? Cause you, you kind of owned up to it a little bit right now where you were like in your early twenties, when you were writing rock <laughs> reviews, you were like, just trying to bash these, bash these artists into the ground. And now you hmm. feel like it was a bit snarky. You, you feel like it wasn't probably, um, I mean, was it true to what you were feeling at the time with the music or was it just trying to be, you were trying to make a, make up like a stamp? I think for me personally, I never felt like I was mean just to be mean. You know, I think there are people, I think it's a lost art and a dark art and like a necessary art to write great, mean, super negative, like record reviews. Right. And you do see those every once in a while, but I don't think I was ever particularly good at what I roll my eyes at is more just like the floridness, you know, and the rock critic jargon and like too many adverbs <laughs> and just sort of the sense that I'm only talking I'm only talking, I'm only legible or understandable to other rock critics, right? Like you're in a bubble, you know, and I'm just, I'm just not speaking in a language, you know, that the, the average music lover who doesn't do this for a living can even understand, yeah. you know? And I feel like what I developed over the 20 years is like just the ability to be a little calmer and to speak a little more plainly and, and sort of enhance like the potential audience for what I was writing or doing. Um, it's the problem is the criticism that rock critics are too mean now, because like I see with like the Taylor Swift record that just came out, right? Like it's some people loved it immediately and like it dubbed it an instant classic. Right. And like, you feel how you feel, but like, I feel like the, the internal conflict in rock criticism now is more like just, there's like a blanket praise for like the Taylor Swifts and Beyonce's of the yeah. world. Right. And it's, it's there, there is a legitimate danger in being negative or even critical at all. You know, like people on Twitter, you know, pitchfork will run like a perfectly fair and honest and like some good points, some bad points review of a major pop star. And like fans of that pop star will bombard. Yeah. The, the writer, Swifties, you know, and like threaten to yeah. dox them. The Swifties, they're, like they're lethal. Lizzo, the Swifties are lethal. Yeah. Like if yeah. they can get, like, okay, I'm a big. This is this is really weird for me because I love Taylor Swift, and then at the same time, I'm a huge John Mayer fan. So the juxtaposition of those things, I'm like, my parents are always <laughs> fighting. Like, what do you want yeah. from me? So, um, right, <laughs> um, and it's just like oh they, God. it's it's really yeah. hard. I feel like because I follow John Mayer's life quite closely parasocially obviously i don't know the guy sure but i did have his brother on the podcast so there's something there but i the fact that that's there is the fact that like the swifties were able to crack john mayer's lair and like get to him to the point where he had to be like you really want me dead is that what we're doing right now like and then the as as obvious as it would be like the fan was like oh i'd never thought you'd see it or reply to it and he's like i I see like right and then I feel like that's the reason why I feel like the the widespread praise that you were talking about comes into play. Because I are mm-hmm. rock critics scared of bashing Taylor Swift? Because I agree with you. Midnight's was there's moments in there that were good, but then it's overall it's yeah. just an okay record. Like it's like my, right. my within her catalog. My assessment yeah. was yeah. it was just like a glossier, flashier, more polished version of Reputation because that's what she was talking about in this album all the same vendettas, mm-hmm. all the same revenge, mm-hmm. right? I mean, she was like, oh, this is a uh, yeah. concept album uh, of all the, like, you know, the midnights and where all the, re- well, all the regrets that I had. I'm like, didn't you already do that <laughs> with the reputation? Mm-hmm. And it just felt, uh, sure did. Yeah. I've heard it before. That's all I was upset. Like how many Scooter Braun songs yeah. are there going to be? 
right? <laughs> <laughs> there's there's at least one on every right. Yeah, there's there's a lot of Scooter Braun songs. I don't know if critics are afraid necessarily, but there's no way to not be conscious of it. You know, like whether you admit it or not, like you're thinking yeah. about that. You know, if you're on Twitter at all, you know, if you have any sort of public profile, even a super modest one, like you understand what the backlash yeah. is going to be and and what could the backlash potentially could yeah. be. And you you see it every time that a major record like this comes out, you see the doc, the threats of doxing, the death threats, you know, and it's just, it's just such a wild environment to try and do criticism, you know? And I, I, it, it, there's no way it's not affecting the way people think and the way people Does write. Does that affect you when you write a review or talk about a song? I, I think it's more subconscious for me. I mean, honestly, like the where you see it is like pitchfork, like the New York times, Obviously, you know, John Caramonica has written such wonderful things, you know, perceptive things about Taylor Swift, her whole career, you know, but he's he's still catching heat whenever he doesn't universally praise a Taylor Swift record. And I I don't know if I personally am of that prominence. Right. Like I understand I that <laughs> honestly, but I, I understand that part of it. I've never even gotten the thing where people get mad about Metacritic. Right. Like there's a thing like you're ruining mm x artists metacritic score because metacritic is interpreting your review as like a 60 or however it works like yeah i i've never really caught i guess knock on wood or whatever but i've I've never caught heat like that and i've always just assumed that it's a matter of not being nearly a big enough deal for my opinion to matter that much you know and that's fine i don't say that I mean, self-deprecatingly but i did that just feels like the truth to me it's like who cares <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, in order to be a good writer, right? Because I'm a writer myself. I write poetry. I have a couple of poetry collections out. So I understand yeah. um, I, I understand the pain that a writer goes through. Um, I've never quite, I've never written nonfiction. I guess uh, criticism, uh, rock criticism is nonfiction, right? Mm -hmm. Do you ever get writer's block when you're listening to an album, you're trying to write a review of it, and you're like, I don't really know how I feel about it. I don't know if I want to talk about this. Um, do you ever get that block? And if you do, how, what do you do with it? Like yeah, I mean, the, every rock critic will tell you at this point, the thing of like a Taylor Swift record coming out at midnight, right? Thursday night into Friday morning. And you got to write something so fast. You know what I'm saying? Like I, th you would see the reviews immediately. And some of those people had advances or whatever, but it's just sort of understood that you're going to write something within 24 hours of hearing it, you know, and there's only so many times yeah. you can listen to something and, you know, so much of a degree to which you can absorb a record, you know, in that amount of time, everything. And some publications like Stereo Gum, like Instant Reaction or uh, however they put it, like they sort of acknowledge within the review itself. It's like, here's our first thoughts, you know, sort of our knee jerk first impressions of this but everybody has yeah. to write that fast and i guess that does help with writer's block in the sense that like you just have to get on with it if you knew for a fact that you had three or four yeah. days and you could sit with it like i think my tendency at least would be to stall you know and wait till the last yeah. minute anyway <laughs> i you don't really get that luxury if everybody's trying to turn around their reviews of this record within 24 hours so people can read them you know friday morning for a record that had come out hours yeah. ago you know it's suboptimal in yeah. terms of saying anything, you know, insightful in terms of sitting with a record or really understanding how you feel about it before you start talking about it. But that's just sort of the nature of things. Um, I the, What's weird about this podcast, like I write it out, right? Like my monologues or however you put it, like that start the episode, they are written word for word, you know, breath for breath. Like I just I can't improvise at all i figured i might try that eventually and it's like no so i'm just i it's i'm writing it the same way that i write like a print article and just open up a so you're Google literally Doc. like reading it yes. as as you as you're recording yes okay. i'm just reading it off never the sounds Doc. like that well that's good to hear it I, never sounds like that. that that's thank you but i yeah that's good to hear but that's that's for sure always the way i'm gonna do it and i i am writing more just volume wise i am writing more words <laughs> than I've ever written in my life. Like I'm rereading the scripts now and it's like, I'm on episode 78. It's, it's 300 to 400,000 words total when you add it all together. Like it's just, it's just an absurd 
amount of words and like the episodes themselves keep getting longer. Like I got to pull back, like they're getting too long. And so it's clear that on some level, like that writer's block issue, there's something that's not so much an issue here. And I think part of it is that on this show, I can veer from, you know, if I'm writing a thousand words about Taylor Swift as fast as I can, then I'm laser focused on that record, you know, and I'm in like sort of rock critic reviewing rock record mode. It's a very specific like framework. Whereas if I'm writing, you know, a, 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 a podcast script about the Dixie chicks, the chicks or whatever, I, I can move from analysis of their music to like the music that came before to like some discursive, you know, personal thing that happened to me. Like the, the, there's a lot of freedom built within the show where if I'm running a ground talking in one mode, I can switch to another mode. Right. And I just, yeah. I think that I just, I can write a little faster, which is good. And I can write way more, which is good up to a point. But I think like these, these episodes are pushing like 10,000 words, you know, an hour and a half, two hours per. And like, that's, that, I gotta, I gotta calm down. But the writer's <laughs> block, the writer's block aspect has, has not been a problem here so much. You know, it's, if anything, the, 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 it's, I'm writing too much and I gotta sort of rein it in somehow. Now, okay, if I may, let me give you a suggestion. Not that you need it, but one of my oh, favorite please. podcasts <laughs> over the past couple of years was uh, uh, John Green's The Anthropocene Reviewed, right? And then what yeah. he did smartly was after he did like, I think, 30 or 40 episodes, he th saw that the audience was there. He stopped the podcast and turned the podcast into a book. And yes, I think hmm. I think if if there was a 90s songs that explain the 90s book, just it could just mm. be a script. Right. He, what he did was he turned his scripts into his book because you have 400,000 words. I would buy that book. <laughs> I would love that. Is, that. Well, thank you. the physical size, like a normal book is like what, 80,000, 100,000 words, maybe. And so we're a novel talking... consists, it uh, consists of novel status after 60,000. Yes. Right. Okay. So yes, this is, we're talking about like a, a Bible or encyclopedia size, like physical <laughs> object, like a doorstop. Yes. I, it's, it's, I starting from my career right there in 2000, right? Like I, I, vaguely had the idea that my career would culminate with like a book. That's what I wanted to do more than anything in the world is eventually to write a book. And this will be my, my magnum opus, my masterpiece, whatever. And it's, it's, it's always been this vague haze in my head of like, this is where I'm heading, you know? And it's, it's getting to the point where like, if I'm going to do that, I probably, probably should do write the book already. So right? what and does like, that I, book look like in your head? Like what, is um, it? Like, well, what, what are you writing about in this ah. vision of yours? <laughs> Yeah, well, okay. that's that's the, the frustration of the vagueness of it. Like I wrote a novel, a very arduous novel, like totally on spec. Nobody asked me to do this. And in the end, nobody wanted it, which is fine. But like I, for a while I was on that, you know, but that's the frustration is like I, I can I can picture the physical. This microphone is, is amazing. I can picture the physical <laughs> object, but not the title. Or what yeah. I'm actually doing. Like, I've never gotten to that point. I'm just like, I'm going to write a book someday and I'll figure out what that book is eventually. And we, we are far beyond eventually at this point. Uh, <laughs> but yes, it's, it's, you would think, and I have considered it like, yes, I have 400,000 words of raw material. That's a problem, but it's a better problem to have than I have no, I have no material, right? Like, you could, like, there's, if there were a way to concisely cut that down, into you a can chisel it down. Yeah. Object. Uh, that's so. I I may try it very well. Try and do that. That would be extremely hey, gratifying. Stephen King. Stephen King said that writing is human and editing is divine. All you need is one spark of divinity, and you suddenly have okay. a four hundred thousand word manuscript down to two fifty. <laughs> hey, 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 hey! Come on. <laughs> that may we you know, may have to do like a two volume deal you know it's like i'm gonna there be one go. of those book series like one of those detective series you know like a is for <laughs> alibi b is for backgammon etc and i'll just i'll just put it out as a 26 volume you know book series what i want to know phase. about rob is that novel of yours the arduous novel that went nowhere because i'm a little <laughs> bit younger and I'm, I'm writing a novel myself and the All fear right. of rejection right. of that is just mm. it cripples me Every morning when I sit down, like today I did some writing and I was just like, I, I, okay. why, why, why am I doing this? And I'm so glad that I, like you brought that up because what happens? Yeah. 
when you're done with the novel and nobody picks it up. <laughs> Tell me. I certainly don't want to discourage you. I was, you know, I, I finished it. I sent it to a few agents, but not a whole lot. I gave up early, right? Like it wasn't okay. ready and I would have had to have done a lot of work and to put a lot more time in it. And I'm just doing this. I mostly did it while I was working at Deadspin and very early on at the ringer like i was just writing at night you know is is when i could write the best on that at least and like i i should have tried harder if it was really important to me but i still felt you know and still feel a sense of accomplishment just having finished it right like i feel better just knowing that it exists and so i would start with that it's going to be it is gratifying doing the work doing the writing and it will be gratifying even if it never sees the light of day you know, or has anyone read that manuscript? surprise? My wife and like, you know, 10 to 12 agents and like five to 10 very, very good friends of mine who were so kind as to spend, you know, 100,000 words of novel writing with me. And so, okay, yeah, what was I, the honest reaction going, of your wife? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> what did she say? Um, was she brutal? She was not brutal. My wife is a wonderful writer herself. She writes romance novels. Uh, self publishes romance novels, so she knows she knows what she's doing. You know, she had she had notes. She had a lot of notes, and she is the only person I think who read like the super arduous first draft, which was mm. way too long and way too convoluted, and had like all the rock critic jargon and stuff. And like she struggled through that, and like helped me cut that down, you know, and and make that a much better, you know, a hundred thousand word thing that I could at least try to, you know, interest agents in, et cetera. She made it like yeah. three times a better book right from the jump. It was very encouraging the entire time. And so now she was wonderful with it. But yeah, I mean, I was bummed for a long time. Honestly, I did. I did think in my head, have this vague plan that like, this is it. Like I say, this is the culmination of what I wanted to do. And this is how, you know, I'm going to make my mark and like all this sort of bullshit. Yeah. But I, I, I do think with a little bit of, of distance from it, I can still appreciate it you know, the enthusiasm that I had for it and like I, the quote unquote, but sometimes legitimate joy of just of just writing it and thinking about it and sort of living in that world and trying something, you know, and so the, I, the I, I think that you it's finished worth it. it no matter what happens for you. Exactly. For sure. The fact that you have like a finished manuscript itself is like ideal because I find myself like I'm on like my 11th draft of this manuscript and I can't get, get past like 40,000 words. I find mm -hmm. something in it that's just like it's not working, and I have to go start all over. And like it's just yeah. like it's been a pain. Um, and like I've I'm doing this weird thing, which is I know is extremely corrosive and toxic. Is that I'm like starting to compare myself to cute, like let like I was comparing myself to Fitzgerald the other day, and I was like Fitzgerald wrote this side of paradise at like what twenty four. I'm twenty six, <laughs> and what am oh, I doing? Like it was 26. I went down that rabbit hole. And I'm just like, am I? Is it ever gonna happen for me? <laughs> oh my god! I think that so you've like got it's, it's, some. First of all, some, you've got uh, some time years under my wing. Yes, and you've got some time still. And I, I don't think Fitzgerald is. You want that to be the model in a few different senses. I think you're doing all right. You know. So it's, yeah. I thought Thank you were gonna you. say like John Green, obviously, is is someone you could John unfairly Green, yeah. compare yourself to. My wife went to school with John Green. Actually, she went to Kenyon with him. Uh, but but yeah, I it's that's well, an extremely. I feel like corrosive... your wife's going to be a good podcast host as well. She would. She would be. She would be an amazing podcast host. But I, it's there's some stories there. I for, I forgot what I was going to say now. But it's. I'm it's, sorry. No, that's fine. It's it's it is awesome that you are that you are doing this. So it's forty thousand words. Yeah. So. Uh, in total, I've probably written over like 120,000, at least over sure. 11 manuscripts. But yeah, right now I'm yeah. at 40 and I feel like it's jiving, but it'll, I feel like it's going to crack as soon as I like, I read into it. So I'm trying nah, not to read tough. back. I'm just trying to go forward, trying to find my way through it at this point. Are other people reading it? Do you have no support system? I did that in the beginning. Right there? In the beginning, I did that and mm -hmm. I found that not to be productive <laughs> because then they <laughs> give you inputs. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sometimes they give you feedback when you ask for feedback. Yeah. That's the worst. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, good luck, dude. Keep going. Thank you. Don't listen Thank to me. Much. Keep going. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I, I quickly wanted to talk about um, that conversation that you, I don't know who you had, but it, was it with Bill Simmons or was it with somebody else at The Ringer where did they pitch you the podcast? Did you pitch them the podcast? 
in October 2022. How did that conversation start? I think it was the summer of 2020. Um, yeah. Sean Fennessy, uh, who is his job title keeps changing, but he's like the big shot at the ringer, right? And he also has the big I love Sean movie Fennessy. Podcast. I love Sean Fennessy too. I knew him a little bit from New York City. You know, he's basically who brought me over to be at the ringer when it launched in 2016 mm -hmm. it was sean who came to me and said like hey would you be interested in doing a podcast and i sort of the way it started you know we have the rewatchables you know where it's it's movies and it, that's more of a conversation show obviously but he's like would you be interested in something that was music focused the three things we talked about were song exploder you know song exploder of course you know where the he interviews the artist and they take apart the song and like the individual elements the bass line yep. you know the lyrics everything like they have the files the stems for the song pop-up video um i don't know you may be too young for pop-up video from vh1 right the video but there would be like these little thought bubbles of like amusing facts you know, about the Goo, I'm sure there's a Goo Goo Dolls video like this, you know, and just who the director was or what was happening on set yeah. or just trivia, just fun little trivia back there in the 90s, early aughts. Uh, and then the rewatchables, like sort of the nostalgia element, where it was like one movie at a time. Like, would you want to do something like that with songs? You know, just one song per episode. And I, my editor is Justin Sales. He was editing my writing by that point. And now he's going to be, you know, the producer, the editor of this show. And we hit upon the 90s pretty quickly as a good framework. You know, the way I've always put it is like the 90s are far enough away into the past to be the past, but they still feel present tense and they still feel like a very distinct period of time. You know, and I went to high school and college in the 90s. And so the the music that imprinted itself on me that I love back then, like I'm going to love that and have an intimacy with it that I don't have with any other music because you're yeah. young and that's just the way it works. And so pretty quickly we settled on like, let's do 90 songs. You know, I th it would have been logical at that point to name it 90 songs that began the 90 or explain the 90s. But like, I didn't know if the show would catch on. You know, yeah, what was the be thought the process between the 60? Show. 60 was so random. 90 would have been like the perfect one, wouldn't it? 90 felt like too many songs. Okay. 30 felt like too few songs. I think it's that simple. Okay. You know, but it is it is completely random and weird. And you know, and for me to say like I didn't want to get canceled after four episodes of a show with 90 in the title, like 60 would also have been embarrassing. <laughs> if I'd have been canceled, what difference does it make? But no, it's yes, it is. It is for sure arbitrary. But we just sort of settled on on 60, you know, and just started this process of having, you know, arduous Google Docs of possible songs, you know, talking to guests. I knew I wanted to interview a guest for the second half of the show to bring in somebody else's perspective. And sometimes the guests sort of suggested songs or sent me down rabbit holes, you know, and the, the show sort of logically came together from there. But yeah, it was the summer of 2000. You know, I started stockpiling episodes. It launched, I think, in October of 2000, like very shortly before my daughter was born on Halloween. You know, and I was fortunate enough that the show did well, you know, and I, I wanted to do more songs and they let me. So now we're doing 90, you know, and I'm sort of halfway, a little over halfway through that because, you know, I, I haven't lost sort of my enthusiasm for it. And I haven't felt like I've burnt out yet, even as, like I say, like these keep getting longer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I keep talking more and more. And I, I think we finally hit sort of the breaking point or the point where I need to pull back a little bit. But like, I just, I'm excited that, you know, 78, whatever episodes in, like my enthusiasm for it is still there and there is still to an extent like an audience for it. I love the way you weave your monologues in the beginning. It's like you start off at a completely different juncture and we don't know where it's going to go. Like it's it's a, like you know you're talking about like Wonderwall by Oasis and you're talking about something completely different and I'm like or was it you, yeah. was it there was a U2 song there in there as well or maybe I'm mixing the uh Bandsplain um I was on Bands yeah. Playing talking about you too. Yeah, maybe I'm mixing that. Bands Playing. Yeah, but like yeah. you, the way that you weave your story, it suddenly comes back to this the point, and I forget that the song, <laughs> which song we're on, and we're like, oh yeah, we were talking right. about we were talking about this song, and we're just like, the yeah. way you do that, it shows the, the mastery of your craft, is what I'm trying to say. It's very, it's very true. Well, that's very sweet of you. I really appreciate that. I, it's, I'm trying to find. I don't ever want to get like too discursive just for the sake of it. Like, like I have to catch myself if I ever find myself writing something like, I know that I'm rambling and I know that doesn't, you know, like I, I, there's like a, 
a delicacy to not acknowledging the fact that these I can go on tangents and I can start from like a completely random place and like very slowly arduously get to the song like I, I, I there's always been a balance in my head of doing that but not overdoing that and sort of not overstating the extent to which I'm doing that and that sort of developed you know I'm reading the scripts going back and reading all the scripts in order from number one. And like I always say, the biggest difference, the very first script is it's like one tenth as long, right? Like it's like a couple thousand words versus 10,000 now. Like they, the episodes got longer and that's the biggest thing. But I also see developing, you know, that sort of winding road to the song that I'm talking about. And I see myself bringing in myself more and more, you know, it sort of yeah. starts with random asides about like just something that happened to me in high school. And it leads to like anecdotes to like the point where like I the other thing I really want to be careful about is never overdoing that overindulging and talking too much about myself, because like there's people who are listening to the show for the first time on whatever episode I'm on. And that's, I'm not the selling point here. The song is the selling point. You know, yeah. it's, it's a balance I'm trying to strike. But it did very naturally over the course of these 70 plus episodes just sort of progress and find some i found some kind of voice i guess that could combine you know the critical analysis like the cultural analysis of what it was like to live through this song in real time and also like the very personal things and i sort of understand that like i'm just i grew up in ohio like i'm boring like <laughs> as a human but my idea has always been that like it's the old songwriting thing right the more personal to you the song is and if there are personal details if there are proper names that makes the song more universal and relatable, you know, yeah. because the listener who doesn't have any idea what you're talking about or doesn't really care what you're talking about, like they start thinking about their own personal stuff, right? Like you're just you're just spurring on hypothetically, like the listener's own anecdotes and memories and nostalgia, you know, and you have to get a little personal with yourself to stoke, you know, that getting personal for the listener. And that's that's the balance I'm always trying to strike. But it was very strange. And a lot of fun to sort of watch that develop and me sort of trying to figure out how to get that mix right, you know, from the very first episode to now. It's I think it was the tangents that kind of threw me off, which was which is why I was so surprised that you said that you script every single word. I'm like, oh, I mean, there there is um some uh like method to this madness for sure. I just didn't think it was like a hundred percent hundred percent scripted because the way that you're going off, oh yeah, by the way, this also happened to me in high school and my mom hates this and that da, da, da. and then we're going yeah. back into the mainstream. I was like, wow, like, right. like that's how normal people talk. And then yet you scripted it. So it feels very natural. <laughs> now let me I ask think you it this. would be unnatural if I tried to make it, you know, if I tried to spontaneously do it, right? Yeah. Like I just no. I can't think like that in real time you know For the sure. only way to do it was to script it now let me ask you this is the 90s the best era of music in your opinion <laughs> i mean yes but because i was a teenager and a high school kid and a college kid you know when i was starting out when the show was starting out and people would be like why the 90s like i would do the line like it's the past but not too much the past you know, but now I think it's because I was I was young. You know, yeah. I went to high school and I went to college in the 90s. And whoever you are, whenever you were alive, that's the music that matters the most to you. That's the music that you can speak on with the most authority, like at least emotional, like personal, like any kind of nostalgic type authority. Like I listen to new music. I write about new music all the time, but it's not being made for me by and large. Olivia Rodrigo yeah. is not making music for me, right? Like I can speak on it. I can write about it, you know, with some perspective and even authority, but like not how I can talk about Pearl Jam or yeah. whatever. Right. And so I, it's like whether or not it's the best music ever made in any kind of objective sense, I could never say. But like music is not objective in that mm. way. It is entirely subjective for a thousand different reasons. But like how old you were and where you were in your life when you heard this for the first time is as important as any other factor. You know, now, and that's I, what I sort of realized very slowly over the course of the show. No, I, I agree with you. But this is so weird because uh, I find myself in this weird conundrum that I grew up in the 2010s. I went to university in the 2010s and high school in the two, late mm -hmm. 2000s. And yet I personally, as as a kid born in 96, find myself gravitating towards the 90s like I lived through it. That's very it's interesting. It's so weird to me. Like, that's very interesting. The bands like, like the Goo Goo Dolls, Matchbox 20, I... Yeah. Pearl Jam, I'm really like 
uh, all the late pop rock 90s bands are exactly the type of music that I listen to. And then I keep my I keep finding myself going back to like self-titled by Third Eye Blind and um like <laughs> like course. Bush and like I'm like why is this music resonating with me? Hmm. And Did I Did you never... listen to it in real time? W- were you listening to the Third Eye Bly record in 1997, or did you come to it much later? I, I was one years old in 1997. So, well, okay, so that's that's so interesting to me because, like, very obviously, the primary audience for my show is people around my age. I'm 44, yeah. right? Uh, people who went to high school and college in the 90s who have similar life experiences, at least in the sense of how old they were yeah. at the time. And it's always fascinating to me to talk to people like you who didn't live it the way that we live, the way that I lived it. And I, I, it's, it's, it's very interesting to me that even, you know, like what we, whatever you were supposed to be listening to in the 2010s, whatever was the youth culture music of the 2010s, like, no, you're going back to the late nineties to that moment, Matchbox 20, third eye blind, all of that. That's very interesting. I, and me. I never like, understood what, what, why. Is there a quality that this music? Yeah. Is there a quality that this music has that you can speak to? I, that, I just that, feel like it does it for you. It, it Yeah. There, there definitely is a quality. I feel like it, it just, it sounds alive, not to quote Pearl Jam, but it sounds, it sounds like it's alive. alive and music now sounds like it's, it's like dubbed under this weird, there's like this weight on music right now. That's so, it has to be polished and it has to be pristine and it cannot, it so cannot. It's like a digital analog. Thing? Yeah. I think that's what it is. It's too digital. Yeah. And even bands from the nineties, okay. like I heard the most recent Google Dolls album and I will love the Google Dolls forever, but I could like, I was listening to it with my wife and there's a song on the new Google Dolls album that my wife was like, and I kid you not without missing a beat. She goes, this is the start of a Hannah Montana song. And I'm like, what do you mean? And then she played it to me, and I kid you not, the drum fill in the beginning of I forget what song it is, it was oh that was god. the exact same as a Hannah Montana song in the late 2010s. And I was like, oh my god, what has happened to this band? And it's I don't want know what it is. Hmm. Dizzy up the girl, self titled. What's the story? Morning Glory. Those those albums sure. speak to my youth okay. for some reason, That's even though wild. I was yeah. not even alive then. That's wild. I I mean I can certainly see here you know, an analog quality, you know, a pre auto tune, yeah. whatever, but like, it's, it's the, the most cliche thing ever for me, a 44 year old to say like music now just doesn't have the same heart and soul. Like that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, and that's, that's not true. That's why I always, you know, that's, that's why the teenagers of today, the music of today is going to imprint on them in a way that it's just, it's not for me. And it's none, no music they hear going forward ever will. Like it's, this is what you do. You get older and you talk about how the music of your youth was so much better than music. Now that's mm-hmm. just, that's the circle of life. And it's always interesting to me when there's somebody like you who's sort of somewhat outside that, you know, you didn't live it. You don't yeah. have that sentimental attachment, but you can still feel alive the way that I felt alive. Yes listening to alive when i was whatever 13 14 that's wild <laughs> but i certainly i certainly get that there's a quality that that pop rock has you know before like the strokes right you know before the strokes before mm-hmm. new metal you know like there's yeah. there was sort of a golden age counting crows you know are you into counting crows or is that mm-hmm. okay so like yeah a little bit a little bit little not bit. so much but i'm i like the, the hits sure I like okay the hits. they're a little they're a little older <laughs> like but the google dolls are interesting right because they were they had been around for a long time you know are you a replacements guy L- yeah i like the replacements but not as much not as like I get the replacements, and I I like when the Google Dolls do replacements. You know what I mean? <laughs> like their earlier <laughs> earlier work, like right. Superstar Car Wash and all that. I'm into that, mm-hmm. right? Big time. Yes, yes. I mean that. That's why I always mistakenly say they're Midwestern because I always just assume they're from Minnesota yeah. because they're so twinned with the replacements. Yeah, like my Soul Asylum. Yeah, is Soul another. Asylum. You know, actually from there, and and that's really wild. That's and it's okay. so weird that's, because that's, I discovered awesome. these these bands when I was living in Karachi. And I, mm-hmm. there's, there's no like relation to that. And the fact that I found them <laughs> right, and then I, right. I got into guitar and like name is an open tuning. So you can play name easily on a guitar if you don't know anything. Yeah, you don't know any chords, right. right. And then can suddenly you play like, it easily? <laughs> I, you know what? I met John, Johnny, yeah. uh, a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic. And I asked okay. him if I could play it on stage. Cause that was the first song I ever learned how to play. And he said, yes. 
but he was like, do you have like a poster or anything? How am I supposed to identify you? And I'm like, I'll, I'll come to the front or whatever. Yeah. It never happened. But like, I'm, I'm so into, like, I was confident enough to be like, I can play name with you on stage. <laughs> I saw them in Columbus and somebody did that. Yeah. A kid in the audience. I And he had a poster. It was probably prearranged the way yours almost was. Yeah. But like they brought him up. He played the whole first verse of name and people clapped, but people were all also like, is this going to be name? Like instead of seeing the Google poll, dolls yeah. play name, we're going to see. I, I get them, that as Google well. Watch over. Yeah. But it was cool. They, he did it for just long enough, just the verse, and then the Google dolls took over and it was a lovely moment. Yeah. But it's, it's that's that's interesting that it that that is it had not occurred to me that that had almost definitely happened before. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that makes a whole lot of sense. So that, just, that song always seemed the, the open tuning, like very challenging. It's very, you know, easy. like I just, it, it, it okay. Well, that's the, good the one know. thing that I'm I realized up that the more that I like internet. learn how to play guitar was that the Google doll is like, Johnny is not a prolific guitarist. He, he actually right, right. open tunings are like a crutch yeah. for him. Like, he, like mm -hmm, he, mm -hmm. he's not that good of a guitarist so he has to go to the open tunings which kind of favor him and that kind of developed sure. his sound so i'm I'm not complaining at all of course it. but yeah it's it's yeah. not that hard <laughs> iris is such a bigger song than i think like yes. in any sort of quantifiable like spotify play sense like that song is just so colossal and i am shocked that you haven't done that song on the podcast yet <laughs> it it like I think the first the one of the first times that like I I started getting into your podcast in the beginning like I want to say early 2021 I I'm pretty sure I bullied you on Twitter It'd be like where's Iris where's Iris why isn't Iris you haven't done Iris yet and I'm like it's it you I felt what, like it was a no brainer and why isn't it on the list yet Well first of all these are I these songs are not in order of importance to me or in my perception of importance to the 90s uh, and, and once we jumped from 60 to 90, you know, I sort of looked again at those arduous lists of potential songs and I'm trying to spread out the obvious ones, right? Like people ask me about Nirvana a lot naturally. And it's like, well, smells like teen spirit makes a lot of sense, but like starting with smells like teen spirit would be very strange and sort of an mm -hmm. anticlimactic fashion. Like there's this a, a, an impulse to save that perhaps. And so Iris is another one of those you know where it's been on the list for a very long time i know band splain did them you know i know they're very important to people the goo goo dolls it, 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 it makes a lot of sense i'm so mad at myself for not keeping track from the very beginning of the requests that i get because i love getting the dms you know the tweets mm -hmm. and i just i really want to know the artist the song that i've gotten the most the tragically hip you're canadian like people yeah. send People want me to do the tragically hip all the time, yeah. you know, in what felt disproportionate to me of their popularity, but like maybe not. I think I'm vastly underestimating Huge. how important that band is to be. Yeah. And so I really wish that I had a separate Google Doc of just how many times people have said like the Bare Naked Ladies or the Goo Goo Dolls. Bare Naked Ladies, Goo Goo Dolls, Brian Adams. Those are the people that like that you have to Brian at Adams, least touch yes. on. I think you've done Brian Adams, have you not? Brian Adams, no, no. Wait, we do I every do everything I do. You? Is that is that the night? <laughs> yeah, that's ninety. That's, that's the nineties. Yeah, it was. In, yeah, was it the Robin Hood song? It was Robin forget. Hood. Kevin Costner is yeah. Robin. Yeah. See, Hood. I'm more more hip yeah. with my like I was like I said, not even born in the nineties, and I'm like I know exactly. I that's you know wild, what man. the funniest thing when I when I tell you about how I, the Google Dolls concert that we were talking about in 2013 with Matchbox Twenty, I was 16 mm -hmm. years old. And I think I was the only 16-year-old there alone and the only brown kid there in the oh, crowd. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right? We did it in the Molson Amphitheater. There was like 16,000 people. And I'm like this scrawny, brown 16-year-old brown like in the third row, like screaming my mind. And like I at that moment, I didn't know that like, you yeah. know, they had an older audience and all that. I just right, it never right. occurred to me that this music is for older people, not for me. The first time it occurred to me was like when I was talking to a girl in high school and she was i went to high school with sean mendez okay so sean mendez there was like right like just, just coming up right he had his first he album out. he still guy. went to school for yeah. some reason yeah <laughs> okay and uh this girl I, at the bus was talking to me about sean mendez and like he's gonna be the next big thing and i'm like yeah right yeah, i was being like you know <laughs> snarky about it and I'm like yeah everyone's like the next big thing on youtube whatever sure. and then she was like oh really so what what kind of music do you listen to i'm like um, the Goo Goo Dolls. I listen to the Goo Goo Dolls and Matchbox 20. And she's like, oh, my mom listens to that. Oh, 
<laughs> I'm like, what do you mean, your mom? Why don't you listen to it? And then we went on this like back and forth and I, I, her stop came and I don't think I've ever seen her since. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a sad but beautiful story. Do you remember when you first yeah. got into them? Was it, it's obviously yeah. this is just through the internet, right? Like where did you discover? Through the, the internet. Uh, we, uh, in Karachi, we, uh, we used to steal the television network from India. So we used to get okay. star movies, which is like the Indian mm. uh, HBO. Right. Okay. And on Star Movies, there used to be um a, the 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 box office countdown. Sure. And there was a really bad Jennifer Aniston movie that had Better Days by the Goo Goo Dolls as its trailer soundtrack. Okay. And so not even City right. Of the Angels, story is insane. Way too young for that. Not, yeah. That no. Is... No. No. I started from Better Days, Name, and then Iris. Better Day. I don't even know what you're talking. Exactly. Two thousands. <laughs> <laughs> Google Dolls song, Better Days, yeah. Okay. And I Googled it and the name Google Dolls kept coming up. I'm like, what is what is the Google Dolls? Right? The, I want to listen to the song. And then it I realized that it was the band. And I was like, no way that they named their band the Google Dolls. Yeah, that's they I I it, it's very funny to me how often they talk about how much they hate that name. And if they had any idea how popular they yeah. were going to be, that then they would never have done that. <laughs> I think for me, I also like the 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 journey of that band and bands of the '90s who had to sort of prove their ilk. Like they couldn't just pop up like that on Vine and suddenly they're Shawn Mendes. They had, Goo Goo Dolls no. did five albums before they ever they had did. a hit. That's, it's really wild. Right? The prehistory, yeah. There's something there about that work ethic of mm -hmm. like doing five albums, going nowhere, traveling in a mm -hmm. bus yep. in a van, I should say, but still keeping at it. That's a very uh, romantic. There's notion. something it's a very replacement notion. Yeah, like yeah. the replacements yeah. like are revered now, but like the Goo Goo Dolls have been eons more successful in any commercial sense than the replacements. Yeah. You know, and like that breaks the heart of diehard replacements fan. But you're right that there's something really beautiful about that. And yeah, at the prehistory, yeah. you know, the power pop years, you know, the underground rock years, like the almost not yeah. really, but almost punk years. Of the Goo Goo Dolls, it's yeah. wild to think about. Absolutely, it is a it's a fascinating arc. It really is. And you were talking about VH1. I somebody <laughs> ripped like their VH1 behind the music on YouTube sure, again, sure. 2011. Me in Karachi, 3 a.m. watching this. There like, we this go. Is the first time it's ever happened before. Yeah, losing my mind. Like they had to go through that, and they had to like this is insane. Like I'm telling my friends, they have no idea what it's about. And ironically, now um, the kids who used to bully me about Goo Goo Dolls are now playing Iris at their wedding in Karachi. I'm like, this is such a full circle <laughs> moment. <laughs> and they don't even have the gall to invite you. Oh, uh, that's so go. funny. You, yeah, I know you wouldn't. <laughs> I'm glad you wouldn't. I, that's, you had the last laugh. You, you were into the Goo Goo Dolls before it was cool. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's one. What do you, what do you think one. about the state of music now? Do you actually think it's shit? <laughs> yeah. I don't. I really don't. I... Quote unquote, keeping up with new music is much harder at 44 than it is, you know, at 34, at 24. You know, I, mm. you just you have more and more the sense that it isn't for you. And like the pandemic contributes to this in the sense of like I when I lived in New York and I was writing for the Village Voice, I, I would go to shows all the time. Right. Like I went to hundreds of shows in my five years in New York. But like then we had kids then we moved to Columbus, Ohio. You know, I live in the suburbs. I mow my lawn. Like I already felt very disconnected <laughs> from culture, quote unquote, before the pandemic even came along, you know? And so yeah. I, I am more conscious now, first of all, of just, this is, I am, I am not the target audience for this. Not really, you mm -hmm. know, and these are not the experiences being described or evoked here are not my experiences. And that's before I started a nostalgic podcast, you know, which required me to live in the nineties to a great extent in terms of what I listened to and wrote about and thought yeah. about, like it's my year end lists, you know, which I take very seriously, of course, as a rock critic, like the last couple of years have been very different. I just don't listen to as much new music now as I did in say 2019, mm -hmm. you know, before I had even had, you know, before this show existed in any form as anybody's idea. And so again, it's, the objective question of whether it's better, you know, the older I get, the more I think that's just not the question, you know, like it's, there are, it's, it's good music is good music. And I get all that. And like my entire job is to have opinions about it, but I just, there is no substitute for being young, 
you know, versus not being young yeah. in terms of when you hear something. And I just, I am never going to be the authority on music now, you know, the way I could at least claim to maybe be the authority on music for when I was actually young. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I totally get that. And, and again, like, I feel that transition happening now because uh, my youngest sister-in-law, my wife's youngest sister is 16. Okay. And I went to, uh, my wife lives in the States. So I went to visit her. Um, and my, she was, my sister-in-law was talking about all these artists I've never heard of. <laughs> And I thought I was quite in right. to the, the, I'm only 26. I was going to say, she's talking yeah. about like Alexander 23 oh, and like all of these guys. I'm like, I have no idea who you're talking about. Like, what, what thing? Is like, yeah, like TikTok makes me feel older no than idea. any new music. Are you like, on TikTok? I, no, not in a, you know, I, I no? see the occasional very amusing like dog video on TikTok or whatever. But as, as any <laughs> concrete tool of analysis you know i'm not contributing anything yeah. you know and i have only the vaguest understanding of what the hell is going on i was saying that 26 is awfully young to be feeling as old as you seem to feel i think you've got i don't know what you know what it is i've been asking a lot of my friends about this and a lot of them at the at their late 20s are like having this mortality check sure like the, well, their parents are getting yeah. older. This is the first time they're realizing that their parents are getting older. They're starting to lose friends to addictions and, and stuff like that. And it's sure. just like, oh, the, the, oh, mortality is like a real thing. Like when you're. I'm not a kid anymore. 24. No, I that. So I, I don't know. That. I And then my mom is just like, why do you like, why are you feeling so old? I'm like, well, I'm working a corporate <laughs> job. I'm trying to like mm -hmm. do this writing thing. It's like it's this. I feel like I'm 35 way before I'm 35 and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I had that feeling for sure. But I being 35 and being 26 feeling like you're 35 are very distinct sensations. And it's not like being 35 is awful, you know, it isn't, but it's yeah. it's it's that's it's very funny. It's you start feeling old and then you act, start actually getting old and you're like, "Oh." <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd rather This is start different. <laughs> Feeling old and getting old at the same time, you know. I, I don't. There we go. Feel... That's the goal. Yeah. That's the dream. Yeah. Yes. All right. So, um, is what's what's with the future of the podcast, Rob? Like, we're gonna hit ninety, and then what? What are we gonna do? <laughs> we got. <laughs> That's the question, is it? I gotta figure that out. I gotta figure that out. I don't know. Are yet. you trying to? Are you gonna get into like the twenties, hundred songs that explain the two thousands? Two thousands. Is that something? That is a possibility. You know, I do not like the term the aughts. That term just doesn't do it for me. So one major strike against it is that the 90s, like people know what you mean, right? Like that's a distinct mm. unit of time that like the aughts, the 2000s doesn't quite feel like. But the 80s, which does feel like a very distinct unit of time, like that's 40 <laughs> years ago now right like that's is is yeah. that too old you know again like the most of the people who seem to listen to this show are about my age you know but to have yeah. lived the 80s as a teenager as a high schooler as a college kid like you you've got to be in your 50s now and it's I, I i don't know i don't know we're trying to find the sweet spot here of when we're not dragging this out for too long and you know it's like we we joke all the time like what is the 90s song that like when we do this song we'll know that we've gone too far like we've overreached because like this this is like the 200th song we could have done you know what i'm saying and like i don't want to give that any song? one song i don't do you know the song funk dat justin no. sales my editor is really big into this song he's like when we do funk dat that's when we'll know we have to stop because we've gone too far <laughs> i did okay i would have said like what's up by four non blondes or something but that would be a great episode honestly i just listened to a country singer cover that song like that's a classic in its way but i i it's it's a feel thing right like we got we approached 60 and i just had this strong anxiety that like there's too many songs like i don't want to leave these songs out you know i still want to do this you know and as we begin to approach 90 the question comes up again like first of all do i still want to do this and second of all can i convince the ringer whoever to let me go on and do this or the, is there they opposition wanna... from the ringer I not really that, no right i would think that they'd be into it <clears throat> Not in that, not opposition outright, but they're just like, shouldn't you, you want to try something else? You could try something else. Like, we don't want to do this for too long. We don't want to overstay our welcome. And yeah. it's absolutely a feel thing. When that would hypothetically happen, I think getting to 90 
might be the right time to stop. Or, you know, if I, we'll see, I I'm trying to keep my options open. Certainly those Google docs are still sort of frightening me, you know, and certainly we have more songs than episode slots. You know, I, Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like we've scraped the bottom of the barrel in any sense in terms of the songs we would talk about, but yeah, it's hard to know when to stop. You know, 90, as you say, is a very round and logical number that we maybe should have started with to begin with. But I I don't know. But I just I want to keep doing this. Certainly, you know, again, it's like this has been the best response I've ever had, you know, the most Mm -hmm. satisfying thing that I've ever done professionally. And so I I, I want to keep doing a show, you know, I want to do this show for as long as people are into it. And we're sort of trying to get a sense of how long. It could possibly go on, but certainly from here, I want to do something else. You know, I, it's, I, I am enjoying this thousands of times more than I thought I would. And I wasn't trepidatious about it. I just didn't know if I would be any good at it, you know, and it, it's cool that some people are responding. No, you're phenomenal. You're phenomenal at it. Like it's, it's wonderful to hear you. And I also love your guest spots on other podcasts like Grand Splain and the big picture. Um, I'm a big ringer guy, as you can tell. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I, I listen no, to, it's, and it's just like that, that's that ringer cinematic universe that is like mm-hmm. spread out like that i love when you like just pop in like you know yeah tony stark's here and then tony stark's there and then you know <laughs> it's like you're the what i'm trying to say rob is you're the tony stark i'm the, of the iron ring. man of the ring i don't know about that i i'm one of the guardians of the galaxy i'm like i'm the i'm the tree guy what's the guy called Sorry, groot i should know this groot thank you i am the groot of in the ringer universe i just say my name in various tenors, you know, and it means something different every time. That's that's me. No, I, I, I'm very excited to see what you do next. I would love to see you host, yeah. uh, host some kind of show on the Ringer Network. I think, I think you're prolific. Your writing is amazing. The way you talk is great. Like it's very engaging. Uh, it's like, uh, yeah, it's. And I, again, I really, really thank you for coming on our podcast. I, uh, well, I we're trying you. to set that's this up for nice a while. Yeah, yeah. Sorry it took so long to set up. No, no, no. I I just was like, I'm not giving up on this. (laughs) (laughs) Now go out and get John Mayer. What did John Mayer's brother have to say? Was that a Uh, productive conversation? Yeah, let's uh, let's stop recording and then I'll get into that a little bit.